tonight, music, medals, and madness. Plus, did music help us as a people evolve? Well, this guy thinks it did. It's harder to lie when you're singing than when you're just talking. In an election year, I think that, you know, maybe we should get the politicians to sing. We'll know who the bigger liar is. Oh. He's worked with everyone from Sting to Paul Simon, and he says, if music moves you to tears, well, it's thousands of years of evolution at work. Daniel Levitin here tonight. Maybe it's evolution. We'll talk about that. Music as a scientific pillar in the house that is your life. A noted writer and thinker and scientist, Daniel Levitin, says it is so. He'll explain it all. Here's his bio. Elvis Costello once said that writing about music is like dancing about architecture, and he's kind of got a point. Can anyone ever really explain why music means so much to us? Well, Daniel J. Levitin comes to the question from a unique perspective. See, he's a musician and a research scientist. He's a McGill professor with platinum records on his walls, but he actually started out playing in punk bands in California, which led to nearly 20 years as a producer. Daniel worked with artists like Stevie Wonder, Katie Lang, and David Byrne. He even worked as a music biz executive for a bit, and he's had the dubious distinction of not signing MC Hammer when he had the chance. Now, in his second career as a neuroscientist, nobody saw that coming, Daniel uses his research to explore how music affects us and why. He hit big with his first bestseller called This Is Your Brain on Music, and he's digging even deeper with his latest one called The World in Six Songs. Levitin argues that music has shaped human culture and that it might be a vital factor in our evolution as a species. <laughs> Everybody, say hello to Daniel J. Levitin. <laughs> Welcome, man. Nice to see you. Um, all right. So, uh, the world in six songs. Which one is Iron Maiden's "Run to the Hills"? <laughs> is that one of <laughs> the six the songs? That's the question. You know? I guess so. <laughs> you know? I give people the the yeah. premise of the book. Well, the idea is that there are six ways that our ancestors used music to communicate with each other, to comfort each other, to form social bonds, to transmit and share information. And uh, the six songs are not six particular songs like Iron Maiden's uh, Run to the Hills, but they're six categories of music that our ancestors used uh, throughout history. And those categories include comfort, is that one of them? Yeah. yeah. What else? Uh, friendship, yeah. joy, knowledge, religion, and love. Uh -huh. And their opposites would be folded into each of those categories, too. So it's an interesting idea that, that, that that's how it started. And is it, is it evolved? Is that still true? Are there only six? Because I, I, there's another couple of categories. There's the crap song, yep. right? That's its own category. <laughs> right. There's lots of that on the radio. And the commercial song that gets stuck in your head. That's right, that jingle where you want to strangle the songwriter the next yeah. time you see them. Um, it, it, you also go, uh, go to great lengths to talk about how it's not just those are the six songs, but how important that is to the culture, that we may not be the people we are if we didn't have music. I think that's right. Uh, to begin with, take knowledge songs. So before there was writing, for most of our history as a species, we didn't have the ability to write things down. If you needed to preserve important knowledge, like which plants were poisonous, mm -hmm. you know, you're a hunter-gatherer, or how to dress a wound so that it won't become infected, this information had to be memorized. That's a Slayer album, by the way, how to dress a wound. <laughs> that entire thing, I, think you're right. I have that record. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I guess it is, so, so songs were the way that, you know, we all we hear the great stories of, uh, of, um, about blues music and how blues music and gospel music was shared in a lot of yeah. ways. You know, it was because you couldn't write down, you couldn't pass stories along, and this is yeah. the way people would keep their cultures Oral alive. Oral history. And the blues are also a great comfort song, right? Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, almost every blues song that you know, something terrible's happened to the person, right? I mean, nobody loves me except my mom, and maybe she's lying, too. Yeah, that's right. right. I mean, yeah. right? <laughs> and you know, what we know from psychology, there's this thing called social comparison theory. 
that you tend to judge your own state by what others around you are going through. So if everybody you know is having relationship trouble, you'll put up with a lot more from the person you're with than if everybody has this blissfully happy 50s style relationship. So how come all those kids who listen to emo can't crack a smile? Like, you would think that, that they would then be the happiest people on the planet, right? Exactly. <laughs> you would think that they would be. Well, explain to me then why is it when I, like, for me, when I listen to um, the, the first four bars of, of Red House, Jimi Hendrix's version of Red House, yeah. that I, I instantly, I just, my stomach drops out and I just feel better. Yeah. No matter what's going on. What is the, the, the science behind that? Why does that make me go, wow, it's going to be all right? Well, there's a lot going on there, George. So part of it is when you listen to any music that you like, dopamine is released in your brain. This is the so-called feel-good hormone, mm -hmm. and that puts you in a state of well-being. If you're singing along when you sing music with people, oxytocin is released. This That's is a big a, part of this, right? The people getting together to sing? Yeah, especially for our ancestors. I mean, singing was a part of their daily lives. Oxytocin is the hormone that causes you to have feelings of trust and bonding with other people. So societies formed from people singing together. Is that why they make people sing the anthem? Because in a sense, people get the sense of enormous amount of pride when, when they all get together and they sing an anthem. And I wonder if, if that's sure. What... And and you know, games at sporting, uh, you know, songs at sporting events, right? It's not just that they make you sing it; you want to. You want to feel this kind of bond with the people who are on your side, mm -hmm. as opposed to the people on the other Man, side. Man, it took me to be told I was 15 years old that I, I before I realized there wasn't applause at the end of O Canada. I just associated <laughs> it with every first time I heard it in school. I'm like, where's yeah. the applause? <laughs> and I'm like, just at a game. Uh, happy birthday, I guess. Be the same thing. Yeah, uh, at, Happy Birthday is an interesting song because it's celebrating an individual. It's that person's birthday. Mm -hmm. It's a whole community coming together to celebrate. It's a joyful song. The um, a, 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 as you and, and I'll point out, it's a uniquely human kind of a thing. We're the only species that celebrates occasions like a birthday because we're the only species that has this particular brain development. A lot of the book is talking about how our brains are different from animal brains that allows us to realize, hey, I was born and I want to celebrate. Well, are we the only species that sings really to like this? You yes. know, they get less sing songs. They know birds sing, but they're probably just talking. So this is, this is our, we're the only group of animals that really do this. We're the only animals that uh, sing self-consciously and know that we're doing it and do it for things apart from attracting a mate or defending a territory. Mm -hmm. Although, when you want to attract a mate, <laughs> singing might be the best way to do it, isn't it? <laughs> Look at the guys in bands. They always seem to do just fine. Yeah, and this points to an ancient evolutionary origin for music and, and evolution. Uh, Darwin himself thought that music's purpose was for sexual signaling. It indicated the mental, physical, and emotional fitness of the singer. And you'll be interested, I think, there's this hypothesis called the honest signal hypothesis. It's harder to lie when you're singing than when you're just talking. We all have an exquisite kind of um, BS detector. We can tell when a singer's faking it. Mm -hmm. And in an election year, I think that, you know, maybe we should get the politicians to sing. That. We'll know who the bigger liar is. Oh. <laughs> Stephen Harper would do an ACDC song. That's his favorite band. He, dude, he loves ACDC. So, you know, uh, he says it's his favorite band. Yeah. But would you see him doing, like, Highway to Hell? Oh. <laughs> he, that would, but why not? That's such a great song. You, and that's where the country might go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but only certain people. Other people agree with him, though. Lots of people do. Um, I wonder, this is evolutionary, right? Now that music has gone away from being the reason we communicate, a need to communicate, a need to document history, now that it's not really used for that primarily, uh, it has become for a lot of people just an entertainment source, will this theory, if so, will it just evolve away from that? Because cause there's nobody in the world that can make the argument to me that Justin Timberlake provides any social value. <laughs> so, but, I, but people like it, right? So it's, it, it just serves a different purpose now. Well, it's hard to say, you know, it's hard to say if, you know, in a few hundred years or a few tens of thousands of years, you know, what's going to happen. I mean, evolution takes a long time to work, and uh, our bodies are kind of, and minds are kind of equipped for life as it was on the savanna as hunter-gatherers. When you, when you look at the current state of music right now, do you, and do, you, do you have an idea of where it's going to go culturally? Because it doesn't need to fulfill all those purposes anymore. Do, do you see a hole where perhaps music still does provide something that nothing else can do? I do. And I think um, where music is going in terms of what it does for us, it's still a better form of honest communication than speech. 
and it's still a better form of emotional communication. It, oftentimes, I think anybody who likes music uh, has these moments in their lives where they feel like they don't know exactly how they feel. They're feeling a, lot of, a little out of sorts. Mm -hmm. The right song comes on, and you go, yeah, that's how I feel. Music is much better for communicating emotional things and romantic things and comforting things than language is. Mm -hmm. We feel comforted by it, and I think that's always going to be there, and we feel the bonds and so on. It's like I always tell my friends, if they, if they don't know how to talk to their partner in good times and bads, just go to Bob Dylan's lyric search. Chances are he's written about it, yeah. and he said it better than you could ever say it in the first yeah. place. It's great to see you, man. Thanks for coming sure. in. Thank you. Daniel J. Levinson, everybody. The book here is called The World in Six Songs. Lots more to come on the program tonight, including this.